to welcome back Rick Carbon and Darby Bradley, our raconteur extraordinaire. <laughs> um, they are poised to share with you some really interesting stories today. Um, the Land Trust has had a remarkable roller coaster ride of exciting projects, and you'll hear a lot more about those today. I'm also delighted to share with you, we have Catherine Hancock from the Vermont Land Trust. Um, our, she's our AmeriCorps Education and Outreach Program person. She's our um, technical and logistical guru. So if we have trouble, she's on hand. And then we also have um, Bob Link, our Regional Conservation Director. And he will be our moderator of these two raucous panelists today. Um, Logistically, uh, we'll, we plan to go for about an hour. Um, the program is being recorded. If you have a question, please type it into the chat box, which is um, present at the bottom of your screen. If you drag your cursor, cursor down, you'll see a little box that says chat. Go ahead and type your question in there. Um, we're keeping pan uh, the people attending the meeting on mute. Um, and we'll be feeding the questions to Darby and Rick as they come in um, and as they make sense in the conversation. So uh, without further delay, I'd like to hand it over to Bob Link and we'll get started. Thank you all for coming. Yes, welcome everybody and, and thanks for joining in. If you uh, were not involved in the first session, uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, tune into the earlier uh, session um, and, and learn a bit um, maybe a more complete introduction. Um, but I, and I won't give long introductions today, uh, not necessary really, but I, I should just reiterate, um, Rick Carbon, as, as probably all of you know, was the founder and longtime first president of the Vermont Land Trust when it was established as the Ottaquichi Regional Land Trust and transitioned to the Ottaquichi Land Trust in, in terms of its title and then ultimately the Vermont Land Trust. And Darby was in, uh, provided early assistance um, to the Land Trust and became staff counsel. I can't remember the exact title, but uh, um, the legal mind behind a lot of our work. And uh, then of course succeeded um, Rick as president of the Land Trust. Um, and obviously, um, I think it's obvious, but I'll say it, uh, these two are the single most, double most important people to the land trust and in many ways um, uh, were responsible for what VLT is today and what Vermont is today. So I wanna offer um, strong appreciation for all that they've done and, and created uh, the land trust as I've said to most everybody that's ever asked me about my career is, is the most, um, the, the best run organization I've ever been associated with. And my wife, who has also been involved in conservation for a long time, we've each been through a lot of jobs over the years and, and I've never been in an organization as with the Vermont Land Trust. And again, I think a lot of it's because of, of uh, Rick Carvin and Darby Bradley. Um, so we're going to try to cover, and I'm going to shut up for the most of the time, because uh, what we really want to have here is a conversation with Rick and Darby about how things evolved in the early years. Uh, we covered a fair amount of material in the first go-round, but we started touching on the organization's expansion from a regional organization to a statewide organization, and I think we're going to focus on that element and also the creation of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board and how VLT facilitated that. Um, so that's sort of a quick outline. We may touch on some important projects as well. Um, and again, queue up questions if you have them. We'll try to keep track of them and, and, uh, and answer them as um, uh, when we can. The, um, so, so Rick, why don't we get started? You can um, kind of take off with the how did the organization go from uh, its regional focus to, to a broader, broader right. organization. Thanks, Bob. And uh, thanks to Krista and Bob for setting all of this up. And good morning to everybody. Uh, last time we went over a number of projects in the early years of the, of the land trust. And, and 
I think Darby mentioned that uh, we were really, uh, since we didn't know very much about how land trusts operate, we were sort of going day by day and learning as we went along. Well, after the first few years, we were learning things very quickly. And before we knew it, we were, we were entering into a statewide program without consciously devising that as an approach. Although with the Tinmouth project, which we talked about last time, our board, since it was way outside the Ottaquichi region, decided to take on a project outside the region if there was no other organization interested in, in helping out in that kind of a situation. And that was true in the case of Tidmouth. And so we did take it on. Then we did the country school project. We talked about that last time and that got a lot of publicity. And actually the combination of conserving 1200 acres in Tidmouth and finding a way to raise a million dollars to buy a piece of property in less than 30 days with the Woodstock Country School, uh, that created a lot of attention around the state. And we began receiving calls uh, for assistance in a variety of individual projects and, and community projects uh, all around the state. And, and I began responding to them. And in fact, a lot of the requests came in from individual owners in Southern Vermont. And it was because of that, that I had a conversation with Bill Schmidt. Now, Bill was the former director of the Wyndham Regional Planning Commission. So I knew Bill well, since I was the director of the Ottaquichi Regional Planning Commission. And we talked about what was going on with uh, the land trust and how there was a lot of interest in the Southern part of the state and Bill offered to work for the land trust on a part-time basis and take on some of these projects. And that, that set up uh, a Southern Vermont program for us uh, and, and really set us on the trail of a statewide program. Uh, there are some other things that came out of the, verse, the original projects that became important later on in helping maintain the land trust and 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 keeping our our program going statewide one that i wanted to mention was uh, springbrook farm owned by john and helen meyer uh, located in redding vermont john was a big supporter of the woodstock country school project and he was concerned about their uh, farm in redding and wanted to see it conserved uh, and entered into a, an agreement with us to, uh, to donate the farm to the land trust, but retaining a life interest, life estate for he and uh, for him and Helen. Uh, and that becomes important much later on in, in our, our history. Uh, there was also another farm in South Woodstock, the Bryant farm, which was donated to us, but again, with a life estate. Uh, also an important project for later on. And Darby could talk about those if you want to uh, get into those now, Darby, or not. I, I think I'll, I'll wait because they relate to uh, one brief segment at the end, which is about setting up a plan giving program and, yeah. and really building financial, some financial stability uh, in, in the organization down the road. Okay. Well, thinking of Bill Schmidt taking on the Southern Vermont program, Darby also came into the mix pretty early on in, in our history. Uh, we needed legal assistance. John Dunn, who was our attorney, uh, unfortunately was diagnosed with a very serious illness, melanoma, uh, and needed help in projects that he was involved with us on. And uh, one of the one of the projects that John himself uh, started was the Joy Farm in Heartland, which was quite a complicated project too. All of the projects that we got Darby involved in were complicated projects. <laughs> we needed his help to, to survive, I guess, to get through them. <laughs> and it worked, it worked. So pretty soon we, you know, we're talking 1981-82, uh, we have Bill Schmidt working in Southern Vermont and Darby as our, our legal counsel and John Dunn still with us. Um, so we were expanding our ability to respond to projects. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was working at the 
Vermont Natural Resources at the time, and in the summer of, of 81, I, I switched to a half-time position with the land trust and half-time with, uh, still with VNRC for a year and then went full-time. And so uh, because of, because I was in Montpelier, I was able to help take on the, the uh, Shelburne Farms project and some, some of the early uh, conservation projects in central Vermont, which gave us a presence in that area. And, and it's sort of like casting a pebble into the into a pond and the ripples go out and you and you start getting more and more contacts from people who learn about what you've done so right and at the same time um, we had mentioned before that uh, when we started the Ottaquichi Regional Land Trust I thought there would be other regional land trusts developed and Bennington was in Bennington County there was some interest but it never happened but in the Lake Champlain area, there was interest, and Darby was involved in this uh, early on in the uh, Champlain Islands Land Trust. And that did develop right after we incorporated as the Ottaquichi Regional Land Trust, the Lake Champlain Islands Trust incorporated and began operating. And as time went on, uh, we, we realized that our interests were overlapping in some respects, and we joined together to hire Beth Umstone uh, to work for both organizations. And, and Beth had been involved in the original uh, organization of the Lake Champlain Islands Trust as well. Uh, so we were, we were building these, these links and adding staff and clearly becoming a statewide organization so that by 1983, we at our annual meeting that year removed the word regional from our, our, our name. So we became the Ottaquichi Land Trust. That's when I started saying at the advice of a board member, when I met with people around the state and talking about the Ottaquichi Land Trust that Ottaquichi was really an old Indian term meaning statewide. <laughs> so we should, we should mention in that in that picture, uh, the person with Beth is Liz Thompson, who is, if she would turn on her video, is with us today. And um, uh, <laughs> hi, hi, Liz. And she still works with VLT as a as a naturalist. Yep, that's great. Yeah, so. So the program was building pretty rapidly. I, I can think of all, by, by 1983, I think I recall working on at least 30 individual projects that year uh, throughout the state. A lot of them uh, uh, came to fruition during the mid 1980s. Uh, I can think of uh, the Joy Farm, which I mentioned in Heartland. Uh, Callis Pond, Darby, you were involved in that. Do you remember yeah. we got involved yeah. in recreation lands? Right, uh, right. Vernon, so, the Vernon Farmland Project, there were a whole slew of projects that came up at that time. Yeah, and so, some, and I just, uh, uh, there was a special project in the Mad River Valley, a special uh, uh, planning group that had gotten together and raised some money and and Virginia Farley worked with, with you, Rick, on that. Yeah. We, we hired Cheryl Fisher to cover the northern part of the states. This was a little bit, a little bit later, uh, and sh a number of, of big projects that, that she did. And then after VHCB got established, we created, and we were able to do more farm projects, we created an office in the Champlain Valley. Uh, and so it just, you know, it, it, it gradually, expanded over time. There was another in, in Weston called the Mountain Mountain Valley program. Yeah. That's Virginia on the left and her daughter. Um, so it just it, it just happened over time and, and of course uh, you know keep, keeping it together financially was uh, Rick's job at first and then and then later my job. And that was always a challenge. <laughs> well, I was thinking of what are the most difficult things that we faced in the early years of the land trust. And we had difficult projects that we had to overcome. But fundraising was by far the most difficult challenge. Uh, our budget was increasing rapidly with the addition of staff. Uh, and raising money for 
staff is probably the hardest thing in fundraising to do. You, know, you can do it around projects much yeah. more easily uh, than you can for administrative, covering administrative costs. So Rick, before we switch into, uh, into the uh, BHCB, which, which I view and I think you do as sort of the most important accomplishment of the first yep. 10 years or, or so um, and had long-term ramifications still today. That, but let me just say a word about planned giving and, and also note that Mike Schoenfeld is here. But when, when the, when the, um, there were a couple of small land gifts, outright gifts at, in the early years, uh, one involving the Appalachian Trail. And, right. and, and then these two gifts that were very large but uh, were deferred because there were life interests. Yeah. But it, it, a, a light bulb went on that, that if we were ever gonna get out of this, how are we gonna make the next payroll, that situation? It was in this area of, of planned giving that we had that opportunity. And uh, uh, so that was, we, we, we started really conceiving that uh, in 1990, just shortly before you departed, and we got some advice from, from David Rar that we, we needed somebody to help guide us. And David Rar, who was the new director of the Vermont Community Foundation, suggested a former colleague, Mike Schoenfeld, who was at that time was uh, forgotten your exact title, uh, Mike, but with director of development or something. And he he took on sort of one client a year, and so he decided to help help us and walk me through the different kinds of uh, gift vehicles, starting with bequests and then, and of course, gifts of land and remainder interest was an issue, but plant, uh, uh, planned gift annuities and right. life insurance and all those things he helped, helped me and, and also helped convince the board that this was a worthwhile investment. It was not gonna pay off in five years. Or, or, or in the first few years, but as a long-term thing, it would certainly certainly pay off. And 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 then when we had this uh, a wonderful one of my favorite land trust members, Elizabeth Nickel, in the in the in, um, in Grand Isle, contacted or talked about setting up a planned gift uh, annuity with us to help us pay off the the mortgage on the new office building and. Mike walked us through. Well, fast forward, two, two things I would say. Uh, Mike got really excited about the whole land trust. He used to go to the national rallies and, and promote this whole idea with land trusts across the country. And if you look today, they all have planned giving programs and almost none had planned giving programs back in 1990. People didn't understand what it was all about for the most part, including me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, and then the other thing that I would say is that the sale of Springbrook Farm, which happened in the mid 90s, gave us some capital to really complete the expansion or go further with the statewide, give us IT capabilities so we could be in communication with regional offices and eventually everything, all of our documents were, were put online. That took a long time and it's a big project, but it was the plan giving program that gave us the, the capital to do that. And then when 19, when 2008-9 came along in the Great Recession, it was the fact that we had built the, a, a, a re substantial reserve that allowed the land trust to get through that crisis with certainly a lot of belt tightening, but almost no layoffs. And, and um, they were able to keep the, the, the people and the experience and the expertise and the relationships that they had together through that crisis, whereas a lot of organizations were having to downsize. So that's where Springbrook and the Bryant Farm and all the other things and Mike's good work really made a huge difference long term. For yeah. so another thing on, on the funding side, as we were taking on more and more projects in the early 80s, uh, and having to raise funds around some of them, uh, like the Country School and Rhodes Farm, uh, the Hill Farm in Sunderland, Camp Plymouth uh, in Plymouth. I began to think that we needed, we were doing a real public service for the state. We were a private entity, 
that we were performing a real public service. And wouldn't it be great if we could bring the public resources in to help out with the effort that we were taking on privately. And some of that happened with uh, the town of Vernon, for example, the town appropriated funds for farmland conservation. And we contracted with them to take on projects there. The Med River Valley, the town of Warren appropriated funds to set up a conservation fund, which could come into play on projects that we were involved with. But I was thinking on a much wider scale and had the opportunity to present that idea in 1982, as early as 1982, when Bill Darrow, who was Commissioner of Agriculture, set up an Agricultural Land Resources Task Force. And, and I was a member of that task force and proposed at that time an agricultural trust fund for, for purchase of development rights or making loans to help purchase land that might be endangered uh, to bring public funds in that could be matched with private funds and leveraged uh, to, uh, to be successful at conserving uh, farmland. Uh, again, I bring Darby into the mix to help write uh, draft legislation that would accomplish that. Uh, and we did. Uh, Darby wrote drafted legislation with the task force and that was introduced to the legislature but it didn't go anywhere. And do <laughs> you remember that, Darby? <laughs> I, I do. Uh, you know, uh, at that time, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut all had farmland yeah. conservation programs. So we were trying to build off that, but the legislature says, oh, we can't, this is be far too expensive. There's not enough money. You know, it's interference with private property rights. Yep. And it just, it died. An interesting part of that was well, to fund the program, we had suggested increasing the property transfer tax. That comes into play in a little bit, and I'll explain that. But it didn't go anywhere with the legislature, obviously. Then we begin, the, the task force sort of went into uh, a bay, it, it, it didn't meet for a while. And a couple of years later, Paul Stone, the successor commissioner of agriculture, revived uh, the task force. And we began thinking about this approach again, but because it hadn't gone through the legislature the first time, we decided to expand it to include natural lands. Yeah. And at this, at this point, uh, Madeline Cunin was, was the governor uh, yeah. and, and she appointed Paul Stone. Right. So, and, and so we expanded the concept of the trust fund to include at farmland, but also natural lands. Uh, uh, and brought in the Nature Conservancy and the Mart Nat Vermont Natural Resources Council into the task force mix. And again, it, it didn't go anywhere. Uh, but Part of the reason it didn't go anywhere, Rick, was that there was a, it was a severe debt problem. Vermont had a severe right. debt problem at the, end, at the beginning of Madeline's uh, uh, administration. And so it took a couple of years to pay that off. So when we proposed the idea originally in 85 and 86, it, as you say, it didn't go anywhere because right. there was no money to fund it. Yep. But in the summer of 1986, I heard that the Affordable Housing Coalition was thinking of going to the legislature to set up a similar kind of program for affordable housing using the property transfer tax as a source of funding for that program, which is what we had talked about for the, for the land portion of our idea. Um, and then Darby told me that Madeline Cunin was interested in affordable housing and land conservation. And the idea of combining the two came about. Uh, and, and we had already set up a, 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 a group of people who were talking about uh, the uh, idea of a land conservation fund. We expanded that group to include affordable housing interests to explore the idea of combining the two ideas into one program. And initially, there was real skepticism on the part, particularly of, the, of those involved with the affordable housing that we were trying to take advantage of their, their interests. But meeting on a regular basis, we ultimately decided to expand the group that was meeting and, and bring in 
the Affordable Housing Coalition, the Burlington Community Land Trust, uh, Low Income Advocacy, Advocacy Council, along with uh, the Vermont Natural Resources Council, the Nature Conservancy, the Farm Bureau, the Preservation Trust of Vermont, and other organizations to create a really diverse coalition around the idea of a Vermont Housing and Conservation Trust Fund. Uh, and, and we started meeting, this is the summer of 86 when we started meeting, we met weekly uh, throughout the summer, the remainder of the summer and the fall and into the winter. Uh, and during that process, we hired uh, Steve Kimball as, a, as our lobbyist and began drafting legislation that would accomplish what we were after. Uh, and I think our meeting weekly and going over the details of establishing a program and drafting legislation, we got to know each other as human beings. It wasn't just interests anymore. It wasn't just affordable housing and land conservation. It was those things, but also these people who are interested in affordable housing are great people. <laughs> and, and the housing folks say, and those conservationists aren't bad people either. Uh, so we began really coalescing and working together really well. Part of the context here is that at that time, there was a big fight going on in Massachusetts between the affordable housing interests and the land conservation interests, because one would view the other as canceling out their interest. If, if you conserve that land, it wasn't available for affordable housing. And I think the, uh, what happened in Vermont is we began to think about things in a community context. What does a community need? It needs open space. It needs agricultural land. It needs housing. Right. It needs economic development. So that it just uh, and the idea of having a single board just kind of helped merge all of that together. And it's what really excited Madeline Cunin uh, uh, and and getting her on board, as well as a lot of legislators on board behind the whole idea. And it brought together an idea that I had going all the way back to 1977 when we first formed the Land Trust. I had established a nonprofit housing corporation in the Ottaquichi region, and that led to the idea of establishing a land trust uh, around the concept of community and bringing those issues together uh, with land being a, a basic focal point uh, for that. And here we were 10 years later bringing that together in the Vermont Housing and Conservation Trust Fund proposal. Uh, it really meant a lot to me, I know, and, and uh, to, to, as it turned out, to everyone else who was involved with the coalition. Now, can I interject? I, yeah. I'm curious, do you know of any similar entities around the country? I, I don't think I've heard of any that took off, even though... Vermont has had this for a long time. Is there any similar organization in other, well, in other states? At the time, shortly after, uh, there was interest in Rhode Island. And I actually went down and addressed the legislature there uh, about the, the approach. And the coalition did form there and got legislation through the, the state yeah. uh, to set up a housing conservation board. They never funded it. Yeah. And it just stopped. Yeah. I, I also think, um, and this probably applies in, in general, that a, a program like this, of combining it, works best in a small state where people right. know each other and it's not different. I mean, trying to think of how this would work in California, for example, yep. or Texas, uh, or Florida, would, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing. But in Vermont, where, where there's so many connections and we keep recycling people for different roles, uh, that was that was more possible, and and political leaders are accessible even if you're if you don't have a lot of of uh, money or power, uh, they 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 will pick up the phone. They will talk yeah. to you. Yeah. So the only other example I know of was in Hawaii. I mentioned it last time. There was I was working as a consultant in Hawaii for a group of land trusts out there, and they formed a statewide land trust but there was a proposal to the Hawaiian legislature to have a housing conservation program and they took it on and established a land legacy program 
under one department and an affordable housing program under another part, uh, department. So it didn't combine the two in the way that we did in Vermont, which I thought was too bad. They did try to do both uh, through, through the uh, similar effort with a coalition, but it, it didn't, didn't result in the same effectiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the only other one I know of. Yeah. yeah. But before we get to the, our legislature setting up the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, I wanted to mention that in the winter of, of 86, we drafted the legislation and we're just about ready to introduce it to get sponsors to put it forward in Vermont's legislature when a real controversy emerged with the affordable housing folks. There were quite a number of affordable housing people who were concerned that the funding that we were proposing for the Housing and Conservation Trust Fund <clears throat> wouldn't have a percentage set aside for affordable housing. Uh, they wanted 50% or, or more set aside for housing. And we were making the argument we wanted the board that would be set up to have the flexibility to make a decision based on what the need was to maybe use more for housing or more for conservation, depending on the specific project that might come up. So there was a chance that the, the legislation, that the coalition could break up over that, that issue. And we called a meeting of the affordable housing, the whole coalition. And I went to the meeting and Steve Kimball, our lobbyist went to the meeting and we worked through that issue. And because I had been involved with affordable housing in the past, I actually had some credibility with the, with the group that I wasn't opposed to affordable housing and that I wanted to see this program work for affordable housing as well as land conservation. And we got through the, the issue and, and were able to advance the legislation to the legislature. So that was a big, big step forward at that point. Yeah, it, absolutely a very, very big step. And uh, because there was this, this belief that maybe the conservation groups, which are older and better established, were going to suck out all the money out of the system. And I think the, the hiring of Gus Selig, who came out of the uh, community action uh, field rather than land conservation field, was very reassuring. And I've always considered it a delicious I, I, irony that, that if you look at where the funds went over the last 30 plus years, a bigger percentage went to affordable housing than right. land conservation. And there were some good reasons for that, but it, but it was uh, uh, it was it, certainly reassuring <laughs> to, the, to the affordable housing organizations. Right. Yeah. So, so it went to the legislature. What what was the status financially um, at that point in time? Um, it went into the eighty seven session, and then what happened? Well, for one thing, we were still uh, looking for a dedicated fund for the Housing Conservation Board, so there would be uh, ongoing funding for it year after year. Uh, the legislature, uh, and I think the administration, was not in favor of that. Right. Uh, so the, the CUNY administration proposed $1 million to support the fund, and we were going for, we went for more than that through, from the general fund. Uh, there was the surplus that year, as I recall, Darby. Yes, that's right. That we finally gone into a surplus year. Yeah. So, so there were funds available that, that could come to play. Um, but the, the more difficult challenge at that point was uh, to get through the committees in the legislature. We had to go through nine different committees in the House and the Senate in order to get uh, the, the legislation approved. And I remember one of the first one of the first committees that we met with was the Senate Finance Committee, and Scudder Parker was chair, and he looked down at the, the witnesses who were going to testify for the legislation, and he saw an affordable housing advocate, a low income housing advocate, a conservationist, an environmentalist, a preservationist, <laughs> and, and said. I have never and the Farm seen, Bureau. And the Farm Bureau. <laughs> yeah. And I've never seen a, a group like this agree on anything. <laughs> and, and it went from there. We've got a unanimous approval from the Center Finance Committee and then the eight other committees that we went through in the House and the Senate 
the same thing. It just breezed through. And then by the end of the legislative session, by golly, even if they, they had told us you'd never get this through in one year or two, maybe it might take three years to get it through. We got it through in a few, few months and the Housing and Conservation Board was established. But the coalition didn't give up at that point. We kept working and working with the new uh, board that was established, which had to hire someone. And as Darby said, Gus Seelig, who was a member of our coalition, became the director. Uh, we made recommendations on who should be on the board of the Housing and Conservation Trust Fund that the governor would appoint. And just about all of our recommendations were accepted. And then we, we drafted interim regulations so the board could get up and running very quickly. And they, they, had, they took our, our draft and, and used them as the first set of regulations to start on projects right away. It was just an incredible thing. Yeah, I, I, I would I would say that that one of the reasons that VHCB that whole program has been so successful and it's gone far beyond housing and and yeah. land now it's uh, it's just amazing the number of things that they are they are doing but the the quality of that first board and their and their approach that that we look at these things from a, in a community way. We, we are willing to take risks. We're not gonna do, we're gonna, we're going to, um, it was important to succeed in those early projects because you're going back to the legislature for, for additional funds down the road. But they were also willing not to just to do the safe, non-controversial projects. They really would jump in if it really made sense. That, that, and and uh, I, I think, that group of people that included Beth Humstone and Karen Meyer and Molly Beatty and a number of others, John Nutting, uh, Stu Thurber, um, really set the tone uh, that uh, Charlie Kirker uh, uh, and Rob Wilmington, who was the first chair, uh, really set the tone that has continued over the, the last 30 years. Yeah, yeah, it's been truly a remarkable success story and I, I'd like to see more uh, discussed about that uh, nationwide really because it's an example of what you can you can accomplish. Uh, so what we had talked um, before this session about a project that might be worth focusing on and, and we talked about Kempton. You want to um, forget whether Rick you want to start in on the Kempton project and talk about how that I mean, that's more Darby's in Darby's uh, realm. George Kenton was on our board, so. That, yeah, he, that, that came later. He, he was, yeah, uh, and maybe Bob, uh, bring up that, bring up the picture of the Kempton family. This was, this was just as the transition was happening from Rick to me as, as president, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, the, the George and Pat Kempton, who are sitting on the right, uh, were were dairy farmers in uh, in Peachum, small, sm relatively small farm, uh, well run, uh, but and they had gone into they had gone into a partnership with their one of their sons Matt who's standing in the back and then Don who is uh, seated uh, to the left and. And uh, but the the single farm, the home farm, was really not big enough for to support two families in the long term. So if you go back to that map, uh, uh, the the they wanted to expand. They needed to expand if this partnership was continuing. Part of the land that they were using was the Mercadante land, which was uh, higher up on them. And if if you go to those two farms, you have these beautiful long views to the to the presidential range in New Hampshire and, and uh, overlooking the whole area. And uh, so, and the Mercadante farm came up for sale. And of course it was, it was really uh, for a state, it was potential for a state use, very high price. Um, and what happened was that the, that we were able to negotiate both with the Kemptons and the Mercadantes and the HCB covered most of this, to buy the development rights on the Kempton land and also on the Mercadante land. 
that gave the Kemptons a chunk of cash, which they had to add to, that they could use to make a purchase. It also lowered the value of the Mercadante property. And as a result, the two farms came together. Uh, and this is in 19, 1990. And if one of the nice things about getting old, and there are, there's some disadvantages, is you can look back at things 30 years later and say, well, what happened here? And, and what has happened is that the, the, the two farms, the, the, the senior Kemptons have now both gone. Matt and Don are, are uh, running the two farms. Uh, one of their sons, which is on, who's on, seated on the left, uh, and I think the son, another son on the, in the back have come back and are working on the farm. So we're now into the third generation. Uh, they, they make, they've built a new barn. They've, they've expanded. They make the milk for the cloth bound cheese at Cabot that's, that's cured at the Jasper Hill uh, cheese caves. It's just, it's just, and I asked George after all this happened about five years after this, I asked him, well, what would have happened if this, this transaction had he said both farms would be out of production today. And, and so this is where that intervention at that moment uh, really uh, helped uh, sustain uh, a viable operation long term. And this, is, this was maybe one of the early VHCB farm projects. And, and if, if you were to look at a map, you can go to VLT's website and, and look at maps of the Champlain Valley. And, it's, it's a lot. A, a lot of those transactions would never have happened without VHCB being involved. A lot of other money was brought into the equation. That we did, in fact, we were, in fact, able to leverage the state money. Uh, there was federal money that the, that Pat Leahy helped acquire farms for the future and and the forest legacy program uh, for forestry and and then the foundations that came in the the. Uh, John Merck Fund and the Freeman Foundation, but it, it all it all came back to really to having having a state commitment to to conserve working farms, and that attracted a lot of other public and private capital into the system, which made uh, and I, what I think the number is like seven hundred conserve farms or something. In that, I don't know what the number is today, but it's yeah. it's, it's up there. It's way up there, uh, and. So this is one early example that it really worked out. And, and I guess the, the whole dual goal nature of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Trust Fund and board, um, an example of, an early example of something that played out uh, was the Martin Farms. You wanna talk a bit about that project and, and uh, we can show some images of, of that as well. Yeah, I got involved with the Martin Farms uh, in the mid 1980s, when uh, uh, the Martins were actively farming the property, but decided to get out of farming and sell the property. Uh, negotiated negotiated with them for quite a while, but they ultimately decided to sell to uh, 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 a group of people to auction off the the cattle and equipment and the farm itself. Uh, at the time before the auction, I met with the auctioneer and arranged a purchase of the farm by the land trust for a million dollars. Uh, and we were able to finance that purchase in part with the help of the, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. It was one of the first projects we brought to the board for assistance. Uh, they. It didn't go the whole way. We had a lot of other issues we had to deal with, but with the farm, it was uh, 1,600 acres of land adjacent to the to the U.S. Forest Service, Green Mountain National Forest, uh, and we were talking with them about the Forest Service purchasing all of the forest land, and and purchasing conservation easements on the farmland so that the farmland could stay intact and we could find a farmer to to take it on. But a, one part of that was a 50 acre parcel within the, right in the center of the town of Hancock, which was good farmland, but it was, uh, it was immediately available for housing. It was a good site for affordable housing. Scroll down a little bit, uh, up, uh, yeah. down the other way, or oh, go up. that way. Yeah, I don't know if you can. Taylor, Taylor Meadow. Taylor, Taylor yeah, Meadow. Just, 
Let me look, um, I can point out the municipal pieces. So the Taylor Meadow piece would be right here, I believe. And um, yeah. these other, other lands became municipally owned There's, as well. Yeah, and, and you can see in the other map, there were houses all around it. So it was a logical place for additional housing. Uh, and that, that very well, that, that could meet the dual goals of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Fund. This is what the, um, the affordable housing looks like as we speak, um, yep. photos from, from today and the, um, the town green. Town green is there and they've also got the fire department. Fire uh, department, yep, yep. Uh, located there now. So it really meets a number of uh, uh, issues for the town. But I have to say that when we first proposed that to the town of Hancock Select Board, they were totally opposed to the idea of affordable housing. Uh, they had an image in their mind of affordable housing that was not, not very nice, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, but ultimately, working with the Addison, Addison County Regional Land Trust, uh, we were able to come up with an affordable housing project and, and see it successfully established. It only took 16 years to do, <laughs> but we made it. We got it done. I found a, I found a great letter to, um, to Gil Livingston in 2000 um, that... Um, was from the select board in Hancock, and it was a very positive, thanks for sticking with this. We're so glad that you guys helped us achieve this. And, you know, it was quite a remarkable arc. <laughs> That's from, quite, um, a, quite a thing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, it, it, again, and I think the, the idea of, of combining housing and conservation and the HCB caught caused us to think about it. That, that was very good land. Taylor Meadow had really excellent soils, but it was it was located near the school, near near the, the community. It just seemed logical that it could be kept for other or used for other purposes. And and it did take a long time to get there, but we just uh, just hung in there and it was really worthwhile. So we made it. Oh, the other the other delicious irony on that one is that all uh, of there were five affordable housing units. They all of the first occupants came from Hancock and Rogers. Yep, that's right. Yep, so. and at the time when we first proposed it, they didn't think anyone would, from Hancock would be interested. Right. Right. Yeah, or need it. <laughs> but the other thing I wanted to mention about the Housing and Conservation Fund and why it was so important to so many other projects was the ability to leverage funds in a way that we couldn't before. Uh, we could get a commitment, say, for a project uh, from the Housing Conservation Board for part of the cost of a project, but we could use that as an incentive to involve others to raise funds locally, uh, to combine funds, to, to, uh, to bring things together and make things happen. And a good example of that uh, for me was in the Meadowee Valley. Before the Housing Conservation Board was established, we got support from the John Merck Fund to set up the Meadowee Valley Conservation Project, a three town project uh, with the priorities of conserving uh, the productive farmland in the valley. And there was a, quite a number of active farms in the valley uh, to, to, uh, to work with. Uh, and the John Merck Fund was available uh, that could help us fund some of these projects. Once the Housing Conservation Board was established, though, that just increased the amount of funding that we could leverage and increased the ability to pull off projects that otherwise we probably would have had a very difficult time doing. Uh, yeah, I, I think it, 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 the importance of the role on the housing side often VHCB is the first funder and that and because of their reputation it gives all the other funders confidence that this is a worthy project if they've gone through VHCB's vetting and the conservation side off it's not so much that it's it's gives a community a feeling that this may be possible that some project that seems so big and overwhelming gets a substantial grant support it may only be a quarter of of what has to be raised but it gives people the feeling that, oh, 
you know, this could happen. This this gives it momentum. And, and right. you've seen that over and over over the years. And it's been incentive for a lot of towns to raise uh, uh, conservation funds, to raise funds to help out in projects like this. Yeah. My yeah. town of Barnard every year appropriates a certain amount of money that goes into a conservation fund and is available for, for uh, conservation projects. And it's been building over the years. We've used yeah. it a couple of times, yeah. but it still is building. Uh, so it's there. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention on that, when we were going through the legislature and the hearings, I was often asked, well, <clears throat> if we're gonna put money into this, how, how is that going to help? And I would say, well, it will leverage funding. And they'd say, well, how much? And off the top of my head, I said, I think for every dollar the state would put in, we'd get three to five dollars in return. <laughs> that was a bold <laughs> prediction. <laughs> and it was. But in effect, that's happened. It actually came to be. Yeah. Uh, you can ask Gus Seelig about that. Yeah. <laughs> I think he'll confirm it. <laughs> Well, so, we're, so Bob, we got about 10 minutes left. Should we just questions? Yeah, let, let me just um, kind of bring people back to the organization um, and quickly look at, you know, the developments over the years. Can, can people actually see that or does it need to be zoomed in? I can see it. Okay, well, let's see. Um, let me shrink it down again. Um, so this kind of gives us a sense of what, where we are. Um, as you can see on the top timeline, it gives some of the milestones that we've discussed in the course of our two sessions. Um, obviously there's a lot that we haven't covered, um, but um, we perhaps will have other sessions in the future, but I, I wanted to just kind of flash this up. It gives you a sense of from 1977 to 87 and then to about 1990, a lot of things happened um, and great developments both within the organization and statewide. Um, and, you know, we, we hope to be able to, to kind of further develop the history of the organization in a more comprehensive way and look forward to sharing it with, with people um, statewide at some point. But let's open it up to questions and um, uh, who's, who's going to help us with that? Um, I have we had comments any, too. Any, any? Now is a great want? time if you have a question to go ahead and type it into the chat box. And you can direct it to everyone or to Bob Link or to me. I wonder, don't Mike. Don't be shy. <laughs> Mike Schoenfeld, do you have anything to say about your connections with the land trust and the early development of the plan giving program? <clears throat> well, I just would like to add that uh, you mentioned David Rar, and David Rar hired me after I was a part-time ski coach and I painted his house. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when he left to, to go to the uh, go on to his next job here at the state and did a wonderful job. I took over the, the capital and plan giving program. And, and Darby, I didn't realize he had introduced me to you, but he was my fundraising mentor and Darby was my, my uh, mentee <laughs> mentor for, for land <laughs> conservation, which ended up to be an important part of my career when we, we conserved the Breadloaf campus uh, with, a, with a donor and raised $20 million to do it. So. But uh, the magic of it really was uh, big thinking. And when I heard from you, Rick and Darby, and you, you made bold moves along the way and each project got bigger and bigger. And I know Darby uh, sort of like choked a little when I said, yeah, you got to do a $25 million campaign. It's the 21st anniversary. <laughs> right. That's the logic. Yeah, right? yeah, you scared the hell out of me on that one, Mike. <laughs> and I think, I think we made the, we, we reached the goal about 30 days before the annual meeting where we have to announce the end of the capital campaign. So. But I think that's a, it's an amazing bold story and the pieces fit together at the right time and the money came together and the, and the ideas got more and more interesting and more and more complex and bigger and bigger impact. It's just, you know, I, I just felt so uh, really honored to be able to, you know, play a small part along that. And, 
and Darby, Darby said, Darby, let's just do this. Let's try this. <laughs> These ideas and, you know, little, little gifts, little gift annuities turn into another one, bigger ones and more of them. And, and yeah. it really is remarkable how you can use gift planning to help people and land conservation at the same time. And I did six years at the Land Trust Alliance uh, meetings and it was remarkable. I just love the people. It's just beautiful people who get involved in land conservation and, and uh, you know, do good things while helping them, you know, helping people as well as communities. It's, it, it's just a, a proud thing to be involved in. And I see everybody here and see the membership go and just say, this is one of the, the you know, the real jewel of that that's not just for Vermont, but it's for the whole, whole country. So I applaud you greatly. Well, I want to thank you, Dave, because to help out the way you did and to see the results, for me, it's quite moving. And yeah, that was, Dave Russ started that at Middlebury for sure, and we really built on it nicely. I appreciate it a lot. Yeah, yeah uh, we won't get into it, but Mike, uh, Mike, uh, David also introduced us to the the Freeman Foundation, and they when they arrived in the early oh, about ninety three, and they put in a remarkable amount of money into land conservation. I think about sixty five million over over twelve years, and that really that plus the fact that our dean became governor and made made land conservation one of his primary goals and, and it stayed 11 years. Uh, I, I remember when Rick was leaving and, and it was another uh, experienced person, I may have mentioned this last time, who, who was going back, returning to, to Colorado, Marty Zeller. Uh, he said, don't worry, Darby. I mean, we were really under, <laughs> under financial strain at that. Don't worry. The, the, the Vermont Land Trust is born under a lucky star. And if you look back, you have to say uh, that, that there are so many things broke right for, the, for us in this, in this state. The place we were, the, the political support, the landowner support, which is absolutely key, the, yeah. the uh, whole concept of, of land conservation. Uh, and then the, then the other things that happened along the way both a combination of, of good judgment and good luck and good people all around us. And so it was amazing. Yep, it, it was. And, and I think back to the, uh, the, the late eighties and the housing conservation board and all the projects we were taking on and how that has led to what is happening now and the inspiration and the creativity of the Vermont Land Trust today. I mean, it's incredible. When you yeah. think of the, the farmland access program, getting young farmers into farming and establishing a fund to help young farmers uh, do that. Uh, the uh, helping out to, to create uh, uh, a way of getting food to food banks uh, and helping immigrant communities establish farming. I mean, this is just all amazing. Yeah. And I'm so proud of it. We have one question that um, came up from Ashley Liz Thompson, uh, who you saw pictured in an early uh, slide that we showed earlier. Um, she points out, oh, Ashley, maybe I can ask Liz to just ask the question herself. Are you, Liz, you wanna tune in? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Um, thanks, Bob. Um, this is going back to the last presentation, which I was not present for, but I looked at the recording and I was intrigued by the Lloyd story and Tinmouth and the Forever Wild easement there. And, and just wondering if that, um, if that was an unusual thing for you to be doing back then and, you know, <laughs> and, and how it was decided to do that as opposed to sort of handing it off to the Nature Conservancy or something like that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm a big fan of such things, of course, but yeah. also, you know, are there other examples of that that we've done over the years that might be a little out, outside of our sort of wheelhouse and um, that yeah, I don't I, 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 Some comments on that. Um, our focus for the, with the Lloyds was to, conserving the farmland on the property and the forest land and and the forever wild part was an important aspect of the total uh, land that they were involved with uh, but they had come to us because they had 
tried to work with the Nature Conservancy prior to approaching us, and I guess it just didn't meet the criteria for the Nature Conservancy. And when we established the land trust, we, we selected our model of focusing on farmland and productive forest land and not on uh, unique natural areas so that we wouldn't duplicate what the Nature Conservancy was doing. We didn't want to do that. The Nature Conservancy is a great organization and, uh, and highly suited to that kind of a project. But in the case of Tinmouth, because of the way um, the way the whole project came together, we took it on. And yeah, other projects worked. along the line of have involved similar kinds of things. Uh, but again, we don't want to duplicate or, or, or compete uh, with the Nature Conservancy on important projects that they should be involved with. Yeah, Liz, what I would add, add to that is that, is that uh, at that time, my memory is correct, the Nature Conservancy was, was kind of moving away from conservation easements. They, they, they felt that outright ownership, either by them or by a third party, uh, protected the natural area more than a conservation easement uh, might. And, and But the Lloyds and the other families wanted, wanted this to be conserved with an easement. We were also looking for, the, as I explained last time, the, an ideal project would get the state involved. And, and so having a working farm, managed forest land, and, and a, a so-called wilderness area, which is really too small to be a wilderness area under, under uh, TNC's definition, just created a, a much better, uh, and being 1,200 acres, a much better proposal to go to the state with and say, how about co-holding the easement with us? And that getting getting the state involved, and that became the model for the VHCB kinds of projects where we co-hold easements, and the land trust does the monitoring and management of that easement, but the the state just stands behind it in terms of enforcement if that's ever needed. Yeah. Well, thank you both. Thank you all for joining in. We're we're past the eleven o'clock hour. Any last questions? Feel free to get in touch with us if you think of a question. We'll try to come up with the answer after the after the session. Thank and you very much. Thank you very much, uh, everybody who, who who participated here. Same for me. Thank you. All right, that's the end of our presentation. Um, I look forward to sharing the recording with you later via email. And um, stay tuned for part three. <laughs> oh, and, and if you haven't read, if you haven't read the uh, biblical, what is it called, the short biblical history of the Vermont Land Trust, or something like that, um, you really need to. It, it's great, and and there's some inside stuff there, but we can we can explain the 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 particulars if you're interested. I think Darby has done a good job of of giving a insight into the original writing he did on that. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Have a good day.